There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Billy Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Billy. Billy. Hey Twisters, what up? Welcome back to yet another episode of Twisted Philly. Holy shit, Christmas is in a week, or almost a week, or it could be tomorrow, depending on when you tune in. We celebrate Christmas in my house, and this year it's been so nice not shopping or giving into the commercialism of the season. Sure, we have a few little gifts for a few folks and a few handmade items, but what we decided to do this season was use the money we would typically spend on gifts and instead donate it to charities or organizations in our community and the Philly area that we thought could use a little help this year. It feels really good. And if you follow Twisted Philly on Facebook or Twitter, you saw that I did indeed buy an appropriate sized Christmas tree this year because I let my daughter pick it out. She told the nursery attendant which one she wanted and the damn thing fit in my car. I've never bought a tree that fit in the car. We had to put the back seats down, yeah, but it fit inside my car. I'm so ashamed, but it looks cute, and the kid is really happy, so that's what matters, right? Here's the other thing I'm excited about right now. CrimeCon. Oh my god, I am so frigging excited for CrimeCon. They just announced the lineup of guests, and Aphrodite Jones will be there. She is amazing. Nancy Grace will also be there. Yeah, she's a little harsh sometimes. Oh, okay, a lot of times. But I really want to meet her, and I'm not embarrassed about it. Like, I'm going to straight up go walk right up to Nancy Grace and be like, Yo, Nancy, what up? The other guest that I am so over the moon about is the guy who plays Lieutenant Joe Kenda on Homicide Hunter. The hot guy who plays young Joe Kenda in the reenactments. Oh my god, I cannot wait. I'm so excited. And I get to meet amazing women from other True Crime podcasts who have become friends. I cannot believe this thing is only six months away. And I've still got a special discount code for Twisted Philly listeners. So if you use code TWISTED20, you can get 20% off your registration. Registration fees go up after January 1st, but you can still use the TWISTED20 discount code. Speaking of discounts, the Sofa Kings have an awesome discount for Twisted Philly listeners, too. If you haven't checked them out since I mentioned them a few episodes ago, you need to. You need to jump on Facebook or their website, sofakingsgroup.com, and check out their videos. This is one of the best bands in the Philly area. And besides the awesome gigs they've always got going on in PA and New Jersey and actually even up and down the East Coast now, you can book them for private events like weddings or fundraisers, even corporate events and holiday parties. Twisted Philly listeners are going to get 10% off their event fee if you mention this promotion when you book your event. And if you don't have any plans for New Year's Eve yet, the Sofa Kings are hosting New Year's Rolling Eve at Arnold's in Oaks. That's about 10 minutes outside of King of Prussia, right off 422. This band is such a friggin' good time, and... Their horn section is crazy. Everyone in the band is an amazing singer, and these guys play their heart out for their audiences. So check them out online, see what gigs they have coming up, go listen, tell them Twisted Philly sent you, and don't forget, if you decide to book them, mention the Twisted Philly podcast to get 10% off your event fee. Okay, it's that time in our show where I like to get into some what-ups. Thank you to everyone who takes the time to leave a rating or a review on iTunes, especially Jen Crush, another Jersey girl, what up, Jersey? Susan Rowe, kind of a chef, who said twist on. That is so cool. You twist on, kind of a chef. Naptown, who listens with her daughter. Okay, that is seriously awesome. My daughter doesn't actually listen to Twisted Philly, but she always likes to hang out while I record, so I guess in a way she's listening. Thinking about you, Naptown, and your daughter listening together, like, that just really warms my twisted little heart. Linus and Lucy, who I couldn't pronounce. Okay, like, it's so obvious their handle on iTunes is Linus and Lucy. But I was reading it as if it was one giant name or word, and so I'm sitting there looking at my phone, and I'm saying, Lin-a-sin-luck. 
yeah, pretty pathetic. But thank you, Linus and Lucy, for your kind words. There's been a little bit of a buzz about Twisted Philly over the last week or two. Other podcasters are starting to discover the show, and they're listening, and they're liking it. I've got some co-host opportunities coming up in the new year to partner with some other fantastic shows, and I'm super excited about that. I have to give a huge what up to Margot D., one of the hosts of the Book vs. Movie podcast. Now, you guys have heard me talk about this podcast. I love entertainment podcasts. Margot invited me to co-host a Stephen King bonus episode with her all about the Green Mile. You guys probably also remember me mentioning my love for Stephen King, for his books, for his movies. So this was a huge treat for me, and Margot D is seriously cool. I had such a ball talking with her. And she's originally from Philly. Of course she is. So be sure to show her and the other Margot some love. If you like books and if you like movies, especially books that get turned into movies, you need to check out the Margos and the Book vs. Movie podcast. So what do we have in store today? We have a holiday tale of terror. Twas the murder before Christmas. And if you didn't see my rewrite of that classic poem on Twitter or Facebook, I'm going to recite it for you now. was the murder before Christmas and all through Middletown. In the Hulliver house, no one made a sound. That morning, Mom Jean rose early and packed the car for a trip to her parents who lived a bit far. Daughter Vicky was 20 and Izzy, just a teen, still asleep in their beds in slumber in dreams. Their plans had been set for later that night, a Christmas Eve dinner that ended in fright. Jean and her girls never showed at her parents, no one knew they were the victims of behavior abhorrent. Before sunup that day, while Jean's girls were still sleeping, estranged husband and father Ernie came creeping. What motive, what reason for a holiday tale so chilling? I'll tell you that tale right here on Twisted Philly. Okay, I admit that was creepy as fuck. So here's how we landed at the murder before Christmas. Back when I was working on the Halloween Happenings episode, I started pulling together show ideas for Christmas and winter. And of course, I wanted to do a Holiday Happenings episode, which I did. And I thank you all for listening. And I have been down in the city more times than I can count at Christmas Village and at Macy's and checking out all of the lights that the city has to offer. But I also wanted to do a holiday crime story. And I found one. So as I got closer to recording, I started rethinking this episode. Is it in bad taste to tell a Christmas murder tale? Like, seriously, this story happened on Christmas Eve 14 years ago. Who murders people on Christmas Eve? I mean, okay, who murders people in general, right? But what twisted mind thinks it's a good idea to kill a bunch of people, especially on Christmas or Christmas Eve? So as the weeks went by, I found myself really on the fence with this one. So I bounced it off my true crime podcast friends, and they, as they always do, reassured me and encouraged me to go forward. Because while Twisted Philly may not be true crime all the time, we are true crime a decent amount of the time, and I want to tell stories like this one. And for me, this tale reminded me to just be ever grateful for what I have, grateful for my family and friends, and grateful that I get to celebrate this time of year with people I love. This story, the story of Jean, Vicky, and Izzy Walliver, also needs to be told to help keep their memories alive and keep their killer in jail, especially at this time of year, so close to the anniversary of their murders. This story takes place outside of Philadelphia, so we're heading up the turnpike like we've done before. Yeah, I still don't have Easy Pass. I still like talking to toll collectors. I'm probably going to keep talking to the toll collectors until they shut it down completely and force me to get Easy Pass. So I've got plenty of cash for the ride, don't worry. And we're heading to the town of Middletown. Middletown, Pennsylvania sits outside Harrisburg in an area called Dauphin County. And it looks like so many other beautiful little Pennsylvania towns along the turnpike. There's turn-of-the-century buildings and small independently owned businesses with turrets on the second floor of their business. There's wraparound porches, enormous Tudor or Victorian-style twins, But unlike a lot of Pennsylvania towns, 
Middletown sits under the looming shadow of Three Mile Island. Like, everywhere you look, you can see the stacks. So if you're going to live in Middletown, you can't have a fear of nuclear power or of a nuclear meltdown. It's 2002. Jean Walliver lived on Union Street in Middletown with her two daughters and her granddaughter. Elizabeth, or Izzy as she was called by her friends and family, was just 15 years old. Jean's older daughter, Victoria, whom everyone called Vicky, had recently moved home with her nine-month-old daughter, Madison. So where was husband Ernest Walliver? Well, about six months earlier in July of that same year, Jean tossed his ass out on the curb because Ernie was charged with multiple counts of sexual abuse against his two daughters. Jean filed for a protection from abuse order. Ernie was evicted from the family home. He was granted no rights to regain entry to said home, and he was restricted from possessing firearms. He moved back to his parents' house, where his younger brother Scott was also living, leaving Jean and the girls alone in their family home. Now, as the holidays approached, it was a difficult time for the Walliver family. A trial was scheduled in January for the sexual abuse charges against Ernie. Vicky and Izzy would be taking the stand against their father, testifying that he raped them. Jean had already filed for divorce, but she wanted to make Christmas special for her girls. Jean's younger sister, Sarah Davis, remembered the three of them as pranksters who played jokes on one another, and they loved spending time together just hanging out, which is absolutely lovely. Like, think about three women sharing a house, two adults and one teenager. That is a living arrangement that could become tumultuous, to say the least, but not for Jean and her girls. Jean and Izzy enjoyed having Vicky back home with them, especially with little Madison in tow. And as a mom of a teenage daughter myself, who I sometimes think she's 16 going on 40, having teenage or young adult daughters want to spend time with you is the best feeling in the world. With the trial looming against her husband, Jean did everything she could to make Christmas that year a beautiful time for her daughters. She loved decorating and took so much pride in her home. With turmoil like that in the family, it would be easy to throw in the towel and say, fuck this, I am not putting up a tree because my family is falling apart. But that's not what Jean Walliver did. She found even more reason that year in 2002 to keep the holiday traditions alive for her family. One tradition was an annual Christmas Eve dinner at Jean's parents' home in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where she was born. Johnstown is further west, heading towards Pittsburgh. It's about a two-hour ride from where Jean and the girls lived in Middletown. Their plan was to leave Christmas Eve day as soon as Jean finished work around 4 p.m. from the local hospital where she worked as an x-ray technician. And I wasn't surprised to learn Jean worked in the medical field. She was described by her family and friends as someone who was always putting others first. Jean was the sort of person who would help anyone and everyone, so it makes sense she would have a job that put her in a position of caring for others. Jean packed the car the day before with gifts for family so that everyone could hit the road as soon as she was done working. And I've done that myself, whether it's vacation or holiday dinner. I make sure the trunk is loaded before I have to go to work so that when I'm done, peace out, we are on the road. No stopping to load up the car. Y'all better have already gone to the bathroom by the time I pull in the driveway because we are out of here. Jean's family expected her, Vicky, and Izzy to arrive around 6.30 or 7 p.m. Christmas Eve night. But as the evening drew on, there was no sign of them. Now, understandably, Jean's family began to worry and thought that they must have been in an accident. So her sister Sarah contacted the Pennsylvania Highway Patrol. But there were no reported accidents or wrecks along the usual routes that Jean would take to get to Johnstown. Sarah tried Jean's house, but there was no answer. And I didn't read any mention of cell phone calls. Mobile phones were definitely a thing in early 2000, but hell, I had a mobile phone in the late 80s. Okay. Story break. So my dad got me a car phone that could come out of the car. The thing was the size of a briefcase. It was this huge black leather bag with the guts of the phone on the inside and a receiver, like an actual telephone receiver handle that attached to the phone guts with a spiral cord. So I thought I was so fucking cool with this phone. Look at me. My car phone can come out of the car. Just give me a minute while I hoist this 10-pound bag over my shoulder and grab my bottle of Perrier. Oh, my God. I probably looked like such a total douchebag. But cellular phones have been around for a while. So I couldn't figure out why there weren't any reports of Jean's family trying to call a cell phone to locate them. But then again, this is my city girl ignorance showing. 
we're a little closer to the country out in Middletown, and maybe everybody wasn't walking around with a cell phone in 2002 in the middle of Pennsylvania. By Christmas morning, when Jean, Vicky, and Izzy still hadn't shown up, Jean's sister Sarah called the Middletown police and asked them to do a welfare check. Is there car in the driveway? Is anyone home? Are there lights on? Now that morning, Sergeant Bob Givler is home early. He's waiting for his children to wake up and rush down the stairs to see what Santa left under their tree until he got the early morning call. And before 5 a.m., he headed to the Wallover residence on North Union Street. The driveway was empty. Gene's car wasn't there, so he rang the bell and there was no answer. From the look of it, from the look of everything that he saw, it seemed as if no one was home. So Sergeant Givler takes a walk around the property he checks out other entrances, he's looking in windows, doesn't see anyone, but then he notices broken glass on the ground near the garage door. He tries the door and finds it unlocked, which he isn't expecting. Everything else is locked up. Why would the family leave home, lock every other door but not the garage? So he enters the garage and there's Jean's car. Someone is home after all. Sergeant Gibbler enters the house through the garage, passing the Christmas tree in the living room, passing stockings hung on the mantle, and he finds a scene that no one expected, especially not on Christmas morning. Jean Walliver is in the kitchen. She's sprawled out on the floor. She's been shot between the eyes with a small caliber rifle at what looks like close range, possibly even point blank range. There's no sign of a struggle. Thank God for small favors. There's no sign of sexual assault. In fact, it looks as if she's been executed from a single gunshot wound to the head. Sergeant Givler checks the rest of the house, not knowing what or whom he might find. Where are the girls? Where is the baby? Vicky's daughter, Madison, is the shooter still in the house? His questions, God, his questions are soon answered because as he heads up the stairs to the second floor, Sergeant Givler sees 20-year-old Vicky Walliver lying in the hallway in front of the open doorway of her sister Izzy's bedroom. Like her mother, Vicky has also been shot at close range in the head. The sergeant turns and looks into the open bedroom, and there he finds Izzy. She's half lying on her bed with her legs dangling off onto the floor as if she had tried to get up or tried to run but couldn't get away. Izzy is also dead. She's also been shot at close range. And as Sergeant Givler is trying to make sense of what he's seeing, he starts to hear noises. It sounds like crying. And it's Madison, Vicky's nine-month-old daughter. The baby was under Vicky, still wrapped in her mother's arms, shielded from whatever violence tore through that house on Christmas Eve. Immediately, the house is roped off as a crime scene, and as neighbors wake to make their morning coffee and breakfast on Christmas morning, they're greeted by a swirling glow of blue and red lights, police and ambulance at the Walliver house, and yellow crime scene tape strung up outside where holiday lights should be. In comes Detector Dave Schweitzer. He's assigned to the case, and from what he sees, he believes these women were targeted. The house is completely undisturbed other than the broken glass from the garage door window. Nothing was taken. No one trashed the house. The valuables were left exactly where they were found. Someone wanted Jean, Vicky, and Izzy silenced. The autopsies confirmed Detective Schweitzer's suspicions. Jean, Vicky, and Izzy each died as the result of a single gunshot wound to the head, and all at incredibly close range. The time of death was identified at somewhere before 4 a.m. on Christmas Eve morning. The Walliver women had been discovered over 24 hours after they had been killed, and Jean was an early riser, and I mean, like, seriously early. She woke up every day around 4 a.m. to get ready for work, so whomever did this, they had to know Jean's movements and how to get around the house to move about easily in the middle of the night or the early morning hours without attracting attention. Now, there's an obvious suspect, but he isn't the only one. Gene's estranged husband, Ernie Walliver, had charges against him stemming from complaints of sexual abuse against his daughters. The family had a protection from abuse order barring him from their home and prohibiting from possessing any firearms. So if he was following the PFA... Ernie couldn't have committed the murders because he was banned from having guns. But he did have motive. In a little under a month, he would be facing his daughters in court where they would testify against him for the sexual abuse charges, 
charges that he raped his daughters. Jean's family knew nothing about these charges. They knew that Jean and Ernie had separated, and they assumed it's just what happens to some couples. You grow apart, or you fight too much, you want different things out of life, or you just become different people. You change, and sometimes it just doesn't work anymore. Her family had no idea that Ernie was accused of sexually abusing his daughters, and they had no clue that he'd been arrested earlier that year and then released on bail and was facing trial in a few weeks. They found all that out from the police after the murders. So Ernie is the obvious suspect, and the first person the police want to speak with as soon as possible. Detective Schweitzer enlists the help of a master interrogator, a gentleman named Brian Walburn, he works for the Dauphin County District Attorney's Office, and Detective Walburn is also ex-military. So this guy is tough. He's a force to be reckoned with. They find Ernest Walliver at a local hospital where he's caring for his ill father. He'd already heard about the murders by the time the police caught up to him, so he wasn't at all surprised to see police there at the hospital. He wasn't even surprised that they wanted to speak with him about the death of his wife and daughters. But the police were surprised. They were surprised that Ernie didn't seem at all like a grieving husband or father. And then he says something to police that only intensified their suspicions. Ernie said, if these women ever turned up dead, I'm going to be the first person they look at. Huh. You think? Real fucking genius, this guy. Ernie doesn't put up a fight. He agrees to go with Detective Schweitzer and Walburn to the state police barracks for questioning. He doesn't lawyer up. But he does act like a pain in the ass, and he's totally emotionless. Absolutely no grief over the deaths of his estranged wife and daughters. So the detectives jump right in. They don't hint or dance around anything. They come right out and ask him, Ernie, are you responsible for this? And Ernie answered their questions with questions. Another asshole move, deflection. Ernie claims he hasn't even seen his wife or daughters since Jean threw him out six months ago. And he gave the cops an alibi. Ernie told detectives he and his brother Steve were out in the woods, a few hours away, deer spotting. Yeah, that's an actual thing, deer spotting. You go out late at night with supercharged spotlights and look at wildlife in their natural habitat. Here, closer to Philly, we call that trying not to crash your car into a deer in the middle of the night because these beautiful little fuckers like to cross major highways at 2 a.m. That's my version of deer spotting. Detectives thought Ernie's alibi was crap, but his brother Scott Walliver corroborated it, down to the time and location where they were out deer spotting. So out of the gate, there's really no evidence to collect Ernie Walliver to the murders. The police needed time, and so that's what they bought. Detective Schweitzer and Walburn convinced the judge who approved Ernest Walliver's bail for the sexual abuse charges to revoke bail so they can keep him behind bars while they hunt for evidence. I have to say, when I learned that, I was a little uncomfortable. I mean, I totally thought Ernie was guilty, but can police really do that? Can you revoke someone's bail for one crime because you think they may have committed another crime? Obviously, I guess based on this case, they can, but should they? I, I don't know. It definitely left me a little out of sorts, and as it turned out, Ernie wasn't the only suspect. Jean Walliver's neighbors reported seeing a man at her door just two days before the murders. Shit, maybe the creepy soon-to-be ex-husband didn't really do it. Maybe the most obvious suspect in this case really isn't the guy. So who was this mystery man? Well, his name was Stephen Chapman, and he was a local junk merchant, seller of oddities. Steve was the guy who would hunt for deals at flea markets, fix up the items he found or bought, and then resell them at a profit, and this is a pretty decent way to make a living out in Dauphin and surrounding counties because this part of Pennsylvania, it's like flea market and antique mart capital of the world. So it is so easy to find stuff to resell and really easy to find buyers for this shit. The police wanted to talk to Stephen. They started wondering, did he and Jean have a relationship? What did he mean to her? Did Jean give him the boot too? And maybe Steve was furious. Was he furious enough to come back and kill her? and then killed daughters Vicky and Izzy because they just happened to be in the way. So the detectives started looking for Steve, and they found him, of all places, at a local Christmas bazaar. Of course that's where they found him. Steve's really cooperative. He was more than willing to talk to police and answer their questions. But that didn't necessarily mean anything because criminals can act like a cop's best friend 
and innocent men are pushed to make false confessions. So what's going on, Steve? You hooking up with Jean? Did she give you the brush off? Maybe you got mad, decided to get even? Nope. Steve was a married man, had been for over 20 years, and according to everyone who knew him, he was very happily married. The night of the murders, Stephen Chapman was home with his wife. She vouched for him. All right, well then why were you at Jean's house? Well, Stephen Chapman was at the Walliver house because Jean wanted to sell all sorts of personal items. She was purging the house of possessions of Ernie's and things she no longer wanted, and it was easier for her to have a broker or dealer come to the house, take away the items that were for sale, he could make a little bit of a commission, and then bring the money back to Jean after he made the sales. A number of the items that Jean wanted sold were guns, six to be exact. So the detectives wanted to know, all right, Steve, what happened to those guns? Well, Stephen sold all six. He had connections to the Walliver family guns. These women were just shot in the head. Can you prove you actually sold them? Well, where do you think Steve sold those guns? At a flea market. Seriously? How can you buy or sell a gun at a flea market? I mean, I've seen antique guns for sale at antique stores, and stupid me thinks they're antiques. They don't work. They're just for show. But guns at a flea market? I mean... I thought you need a permit to buy a gun, and you have to get a background check, and we don't have a gun registration problem in our country with people selling guns at flea markets. Yeah, I probably just pissed off a few listeners with that one. I'm okay with that. Even though Steve has an alibi, the story is starting to sound a little flimsy. He can't remember the name of the man to whom he sold the guns. He has no proof of sale. He doesn't give out receipts for the sales he makes at flea markets. It's only really his word that he sold them and gave Jean the money. But again, that wife of his backed up his alibi, and Stephen even offered to let the police search his house, which they did, and there was nothing tying him to the murders. No guns, no evidence, nothing to indicate he was responsible. So the police cut him loose. A week goes by. It's New Year's Eve. Detectives continue hunting for suspects. Yeah, everyone's gut, including mine, told them Ernie was their man, but with no evidence and a corroborated alibi, they have to continue searching. There's never been a crime like this in Middletown. The police need to get it right. They need to assure the community there's nothing to fear from a random serial killer. Vicki Walliver's ex-boyfriend was also questioned, 25-year-old Will Connors. Theirs was one of those hot and cold relationships, on again, off again for years, until about two years before the murders, when Vicki ended it for good. Will admitted to police he didn't want to take no for an answer. He thought Vicki was the love of his life, even after she had a baby with another man a few years after she and Will broke up. So the police wondered, was this a case of, if I can't have you, no one can? Had Will committed these horrible crimes, and this time it was Jean and Izzy who were in the way? Will had recently been spending some time hanging out at the Walliver house, doing odd jobs, helping Jean with minor home repairs. He was hoping to get back in Vicky's good graces. One of the home repairs Will provided was changing the locks after Ernie was removed from the home. Will was a locksmith, so it would have been pretty easy for this guy to get in and out of their house. Maybe he made a spare key. But whomever went into the Walliver home on Christmas Eve broke a window in the garage door to gain entrance. Maybe that was a setup. Someone actually had a key but broke a window to make it look like they couldn't get in. And Will's alibi was flimsy. He was at home, alone, in bed. I probably shouldn't call that a flimsy alibi because when my daughter stays at a friend's house or at her dad's, I'm home alone. So my only alibi for nights like that would be the same thing. I was home alone in bed, and I don't think the dogs could alibi me. I know damn sure the cat wouldn't. Between Steve Chapman, the junk dealer, and Vicky's old boyfriend, Will Connors, the police had persons of interest, but no evidence linking either one of them to the murders of Jean, Vicky, and Izzy. Detective Schweitzer decides to circle back around to Ernie, but he does this through his brother, Scott. Out of all the interviews the detectives conducted, they felt like Scott Walliver was the weakest link. While he was able to back up Ernie's alibi, he was nervous and even shifty. The police thought he was hiding something, so they decided to take a harder approach. 
The detectives bring Steve Wallaber back in for questioning, and this time they show him pictures of the crime scene. They show him photographs of his sister-in-law, splayed out on the kitchen floor, and his niece Vicky lying in a pool of blood in the hallway. His 15-year-old niece Izzy, dead in her bedroom. And Scott breaks down. He loses it when he sees the bodies of his sister-in-law, his nieces. He almost collapsed, and he told the police, I want to tell you what really happened. On Christmas Eve, Scott and Ernie were out drinking, and after a few hours, they were both pretty tanked. So Ernie says, I want to take a drive by Gene's house. He tells his brother Scott that he wants to steal the family dog to get back at his girls for reporting him for sexual abuse. Neither Ernie nor Scott knew the family dog had died a few weeks before the murders, so there was no dog to steal. Ernie tells Scott to park about a block away so the family and the neighbors don't see the car. Both of them are drunk off their ass, like a couple of geniuses we're talking about here. Ernie asks Scott to unlock the car so he can get something out of the back, and then he walks the block or so away to his old house on Union Street while Scott waits in the car. And after about five or ten minutes, Ernie rushes back to the car, and Scott describes him as excited and frantic. And so Scott asks him, what's going on? Where's the dog? Because Ernie's empty-handed. Well, I think we all know he had no intention of stealing the family dog, whether it was alive or not. The only thing on Ernie's mind that Christmas Eve was murder. Ernie jumped in the car and says to Scott, you'll never believe what I saw, and tells him, drive, drive, drive away. Scott claims Ernie never told him anything about wanting to kill anyone. He didn't even know Ernie had a gun on him. Detective Schweitzer and Special Investigator Detective Walburn really believed Scott knew more than he was telling them, so they continued to push him. And Scott admitted that after leaving the Walliver home, Ernie told him to pull over into the woods alongside a highway. Ernie got out of Scott's car, but Scott says he had no idea what it was that Ernie ditched in the woods. Scott led the police to the spot where he pulled over a week before on Christmas Eve, and in the woods along a creek bed, the police find a handgun, which matches the bullets that killed Jean Walliver and her daughters Vicky and Izzy. Police then secured warrants to search Scott's car, Ernie's car, their Middletown residence where Jean and his daughters lived, and his parents' home in Cabria County. Between the gun evidence and Scott's testimony, on August 31st, 2004, Ernie was charged with three counts of first-degree murder, and his brother Scott Walliver was charged with three counts of third-degree murder for acting as an accessory. Scott was the prosecution's star witness. Between his testimony about their activities that night and Ernie's insistence that if he was questioned about their whereabouts Christmas Eve, Scott should tell his family and police they were out deer spotting. Plus, hearing his brother say he wanted to kill his wife after she filed for divorce a few months earlier, Scott's testimony really sealed his brother's fate. Because Vicky and Izzy were scheduled to testify against him in January for the sexual abuse charges, he was also charged with killing prosecutorial witnesses. But since those witnesses were gone, they could no longer testify against him, which was ultimately what he wanted. And the sexual abuse charges were dropped. And then there were prison witnesses who testified against Ernie Walliver. As if everything he did wasn't bad enough on Christmas Eve. While in prison, Ernie tried to hire someone to kill the father of Vicky's daughter, Madison. Her father was Francisco Ramos. Ernest was connected to a man in West Virginia. Now, this supposedly was someone who said he was willing to take the hit, but it was a setup. What Ernie wanted was not only for this man to kill Francisco Ramos, but to also plant evidence to make it look like Ramos was the one who killed Jean, Vicky, and Izzy. So now let's add attempted murder to the list of charges, as well as reckless endangerment of Madison, because although she survived, she was left in her mother's arms unattended for over 24 hours between the early morning of Christmas Eve until Sergeant Glover found her on Christmas morning. Ernest Walliver was sentenced to death, yet here he still sits on death row. In 2006, he filed an appeal challenging his conviction and death sentences. He challenged the verdicts, claiming there was insufficient funds for the defense to hire proper psychiatrists and investigators and experts. He further stated it was unfair for the court to introduce prior statements made by the victims regarding their sexual abuse charges. Well, asshole, maybe if you hadn't killed them, 
they would have been able to testify against you in the sexual abuse trial, and you wouldn't have to complain it's not fair to use their statements made before their death in your murder trial. So his 2006 appeal was denied. Ernest Wallaber was back in court again with another appeal in 2013. This time, the Federal Public Defender's Office said Ernie didn't get effective legal representation during his trial in 2004. After much waste of the taxpayers' money, with testimony from district attorneys, defense attorneys, evidentiary reviews, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court again denied Ernie's appeal for relief from the death sentences. In 2015, Ernest tried to bring suit against the state, for a beating he claimed to sustain while he was in county jail during one of his stays while he was pursuing his 2013 appeal. County court ruled the case was without merit and there was no evidence to prove assault, so Ernie took it up to the state Supreme Court, and the state Supreme Court upheld the county judge's ruling. So Ernie still sits on death row awaiting his execution. He is now 56 years old. His brother Scott Wallover is also still in prison. He was sentenced to 12 to 25 years, for third-degree murder as an accessory. And what about little Madison, who was just nine months old the night her mother, her grandmother, and her aunt were murdered? Madison Wallover is the lone survivor of that horrible night, and right now she'd probably be about 15 years old. She lives with her father outside of the Harrisburg area, and from what I've read about her, she's a pretty special young lady who grew up knowing about her family, and especially her mother's love. Murder sucks. I know that sounds stupid, but it, it does. Losing a family member absolutely sucks. Losing anyone you love is a nightmare any time of year, but something about it happening around the holidays makes it harder. It makes it more painful. About 18 years ago, we lost my father just before Thanksgiving, unexpectedly. And just last week, my ex-husband lost one of his older brothers, one of my brothers-in-law. And I know you're probably sitting there thinking, wait a minute, didn't you tell me you're divorced? I am, but my ex-husband's family never really stopped being part of my family. So for many people, this time of year is difficult. We talk about the holidays being festive and fun and beautiful, and they can be, but not always and not for everyone. So my request of you, Twisters, would be, regardless of what you celebrate, regardless of what religion you may or may not practice, it would be to think about others and think about what some folks might be feeling or experiencing during the most wonderful time of year that maybe isn't so wonderful for everybody. So this is our second to last episode for the year. I have one more episode coming up before the end of 2016. It will be a lot lighter than this one, I promise. You know me, I do a couple of true crime and then I'm like, holy shit, I'm depressed and I have to go do something crazy and zany and funny, yet still twisted and probably a little bit dark. I've had some great story suggestions from listeners. I love that. I so appreciate when you reach out and tell me what you want to hear about. So some of those we'll definitely cover in early 2017. There's also going to be some crossover episodes with me sitting in on other podcasts and other hosts joining me on Twisted Philly. So who knows what the hell we'll get up to next year. That's it from me. Ciao for now, Twisters. Twisters.